this separation, this division, the rapture, will happen suddenly. It will come suddenly. And it will come soon. Very soon. And therefore, we must be ready. Now. I want to talk about separation or division, division caused by God. Division or separation that comes before destruction and it comes soon and sudden. That's the theme. And um, I want to read three uh, scriptures first and uh, you'll see how they relate to each other. The first is from Luke 11 verse 23. It says there, he that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. The second is from Jude, verses 18 and 19. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. And the last one is from Matthew 25, the verses 31 through 33. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divided his sheep from among the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. The last was verse 46. So three scriptures and you see that the key words here are gathering, scattering, separating, dividing. And none of these three leave us with a positive feeling. God is one. He is unity. And uh, he's represented by the number one. Uh, he is whole. Um, and in him, as it says in Colossians 3, in him all are called into one body. Uh, other scriptures tell us that it's the good shepherd who gathers the sheep into one flock. This one, this union is key. But there's also division and separation. First of all, sin separates us from God. Sin that is born from the devil or from our human wicked hearts. And as soon as sin separates, there are two parties. God on one side and the sinner on the other. And they cannot go together. And so the number two represents division. It might, by the way, represent union if the two come together, but... Uh, basically, one is the number for union and two for division. Now, the prime mover of this separation is not Satan. Satan may instigate the sin, but after that, separation is the result. It's God himself who separates. The division is the result of his, uh, his, his judgment. Satan, on the other hand... Wants, um, wants, us to, to, wants to make us believe that, that good and evil, they can go together. Um, that uh, which God made unique and after its own kind, that you can mingle these things. Um, that what is pure can, be, can go together with that that is defiled. And there are many examples around us of this. And, uh, put here on the screen some symbols. Uh, you see, of course, the, the, the ancient symbol of uh, yin and yang, which, which um, represents good and evil um, being harmoniously together. Um, this, is, this is what uh, is the doctrine of Satan. You see the two-headed eagle uh, um, uh, representing east and west, but they are united uh, together, um, although they, they face different directions. Um, Another symbol that is, uh, we see uh, more and more um, uh, on, on bathrooms, 
uh, where it's gender neutral or um, how do they say family friendly or something. Uh, anyway, uh, also we see the, the mingling of, of genders eh? and, uh, and uh, yeah, the rede redefining it. Um, we have equality eh? between men and women. Now, of course, there uh, should be equality in the sense that there should not be discrimination, but uh, there are still two different um, uh, uh, genders, eh? two different people, if you will, men and women. They, uh, they cannot be put together and... Um, regarded the same. They are different and they're different for a reason. We have the symbol for inclusion. Uh, include everyone, no matter um, who or what or, uh, or how um, everything goes together. Uh, I put in there also the symbol for, uh, for uh, the green agenda, yeah, or climate uh, agenda. Um, we see again there uh, mixed um, uh, objectives uh, that actually contradict uh, one another. And of course um, we see also that religions are mingled, that um, it is said of different and especially of the, the three main, uh, the biggest religions that um, it's all the same God that we worship. Um, that is however not so. Anyway, there could be more examples uh, and I spoke about this in uh, an uh, prior video called uh, Duality Deception. Um, but God says to all this, no, no. And in his judgment, he separates the two. He says, good and evil cannot go together. They have to be one on one side, the other on the other side. Um, he separates the sheep and the goat, as we just read. He separates the, the, the wheat and the tares. Uh, and he treats one quite different uh, than the other. Um, we can say, uh, in, in a way, that Satan is scattering that which God brought together. And he is uniting that which God made separate, made unique in its kind. Um, but, God, but God, in his judgment, separates, divides, divides those that are truly his, from the opposition, from the impostors, from the hypocrites, uh, from the unredeemed. And what we see um, in, in these scriptures and in others that we're going to read is that uh, this division always comes before the judgment. Uh, it is to spare his children from his wrath, from the coming judgment. It comes before the judgment and it often comes at the last moment. Plus, it often comes suddenly, unexpected. These are some characteristics that we're going to look at, and they are very important because in this, uh, this day we are actually uh, expecting another separation uh, and coming judgment right after that. And this separation and the, the following judgment will be sudden and unexpected to most. So I want to look at some examples uh, from Scripture. And the first one is from Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, um, and I want to read verses 38 through 41. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving into marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field. One shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. One shall be taken, and the other left. Now the reference to the flood clearly speaks of sudden and unexpected destruction. The wrath of God. They knew not until the flood came, it came unexpected. Jesus uses this event of the flood as an illustration of the coming wrath at the end of the age. And he mentions the two men in the field and two women at the mill. And in both cases, one of them is taken and one is left behind. Before the judgment comes, God divides or splits up the people. And there are only two pos uh, possibilities, two categories, uh, which is emphasized by this one man uh, and one woman. Uh, one is taken, one stays behind this 50-50 division. 
Uh, it's sheep and goat, it's, it's tares and wheat. There is not more uh, tastes. And um, what we also should note here in this um, parable is that the two individuals, um, uh, the men or the women, are both servants of God. And one is wicked and one is wise. In the same uh, chapter, um, um, there's another parable in verse 45 through 51. I want to read that as well. It says there, Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find doing so. Verily, I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him from his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The master comes when not expected, eh? As in, at an hour he does not know. And again there is a 50-50 division. One servant is blessed, is rewarded, and the other is actually cut in pieces, it says. And then it says that the wicked one is put with the hypocrites. Why? Because he has led a double life. He is pretending to be a servant, yeah, pretending to serve God, while in reality serving himself and abusing God's other true servants. He has disguised himself as a minister of God, just like Satan does, as we can read in 2 Corinthians 11. And like all hypocrites, he has led a mock life. Jesus continues to give more parables to, um, to bring this point clearly across. And so from Matthew 24, it continues then in Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, with the famous parable of the ten virgins. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read this whole um, parable, but it's Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. The well-known parable of the ten virgins. And it teaches us how the reality of God's judgment should change our thinking on, and our actions, our conduct. These ten virgins represent all of God's people waiting to meet the groom. And they all think they are ready. But five of them, which again it's half, uh, they were not ready. And they are designated as foolish. Now well, they mainly fooled themselves, of course. And as the other five go into the marriage, um, they, uh, the, the door is shut unto them. And um, we learn from this parable that Jesus never knew them, that they were never true followers of Christ. And right after that, there is the next parable, the parable of the talents in um, uh, verse 14 through 30. Now, that seems a bit out of line. Because it seems to be that there are not two, but three groups there. Yeah, one with five talents, one with two talents, and one with one talent. But here also there is a 50-50 split. Because the first two servants, yeah, the one with five and the one with two talents, they are equally rewarded, equally. And they are also um, both called good and faithful servants yeah, in verse 21 and verse 23. So they, they are regarded the same. This is one and the same group. Uh, but the other one, the one with one talent, he is called a wicked and slothful servant who is cast into outer darkness. So let's also look at an example of the vision and judgment from the Old Testament. And um, there are uh, quite a few. But I want to read from uh, Jeremiah 24. And this um, is also a parable uh, of sorts. And um, yeah, I think we need to read the whole chapter. Well, it's 10 verses. It's not that long, but um, to keep the context uh, correct. So Jeremiah 24 verses 1 through 10. The Lord showed me, that's Jeremiah, 
And behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. After that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah, with the carpenters and smiths from Jerusalem, and had brought them to Babylon. One basket had very good figs, even like the figs that are first ripe. And the other basket had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten, they were so bad. Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs, the good figs, very good, and the evil, very evil, that cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans, for their good. For I will set my eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land. And I will build them, and not pull them down, and I will plant them, and not pluck them up, and I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. And as the evil figs, which cannot be eaten, they are so evil, surely thus saith the Lord, so will I give Zedekiah the king of Judah and his princes and the residue of Jerusalem that remain in this land, and them that dwell in the land of Egypt. And I will deliver them to be removed into all, into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt, to be a reproach and a proverb, a taunt and a curse in all places whither I shall drive them. And I will send the sword, the famine and the pestilence among them until they be consumed from off the land that I gave unto them and to their fathers." So, uh, note uh, as a side note that in verse 1 and 2 it mentions that these are the first ripe figs that are set before the temple to, in baskets. Uh, that shows that this um, happened uh, or yeah, takes place uh, at the Feast of First Fruits. That is when the first fruits of the, of the, of the land is uh, put in baskets in front of the, of the temple and then the priest would uh, take these baskets and uh, wave them as a wave offering um, to the Lord. So, but that's a side note. Um, what is clear here is that God divides his people, uh, which is uh, pertaining to Judah, into two groups again. <clears throat> One group is represented by the very good figs. They are uh, the first ripe, it says, and the first ripe are considered the best. And so... Uh, yeah, another side note, we spoke a few weeks ago about the fig tree that uh, Jesus cursed. And this is what he expected. These first ripe figs that were actually out of season, but uh, that were um, first ripe, that were the best, would be the best fruit uh, you can have. Uh, and he found nothing on the tree. Uh, but here we see a basket with these good figs, and um, these were the true Israelites, as um, Jesus calls it in John 1, verse 47, who receive God's blessing. God says, they shall be my people, and I will be their God. But the other group will be dispersed among the nations and made into a reproach, and they will be given to the sword famine and to pestilence. And if we read these three, then of course we have to think of the four horses of the apocalypse as mentioned in Revelation 6. This talks all about judgment. So we see again one uh, group uh, to be blessed and the other group to, be, uh, to, to suffer the judgment of God. Um, so if we look at these examples, and there are many more, we can see a few commonalities. Um, first of all, God divides into two groups. Secondly, God is judging. And thirdly, there is an end time context. This is also important. It's important especially for us as we live in the end time in the very last days. So at first glance, there is a unified group. Uh, grinders at the mill, workers in the field, virgins waiting awaiting the groom, 
servants of the same master. Uh, and in this last example, the people of Judah. A unified group. But this unity is only apparent. God sees that there is disunion on the level of commitment and obedience. And so what may not be clear to man is clear to God. And he separates the group into two parts. The flock suddenly appears to be made up of sheep and goats. And the field suddenly appears to be both wheat and tares. It's that what Satan makes uh, to appear as, as un, a union and unity that God says no. This is not, this is not a, a unity. I will separate it according to what I see. So this yin, yin and yang, this good and evil, uh, all these things that, that uh, we see around us, this does not hold. God will separate it and show the true face. The destiny of these two groups could also not be more apart. One is blessed and the other is cursed. And what we see from scripture is that there is uh, no period of church unity in the end. No revival of Christianity. If anything of that nature, it will be only apparent. Actually, Jesus speaks about a lukewarm church. It's not hot, cold, separated. No, it's together and it is lukewarm while God will separate it. But that's the last church, the church of the last days. And there's a reason why, um, why this is so. Uh, just like the wheat and the tares, they grow together until shortly before the harvest. Then their true nature is revealed. This, the, the fact that they can coexist, to use this word, is only that there is time to repent for those that are on the wrong side, but um, it's also to make the true nature uh, expose itself, actually. And this is what um, Paul also writes to the Corinthians in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 19. He says, for there must, there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. This, these heresies in this case, they will expose those that are uh, on the wrong side as opposed to those that are approved. Now there's another common characteristic between all these examples of God separating and judging. And that's the element of surprise. It comes suddenly. The people are caught off guard. There's an uh, element of surprise in the line of the vision, how God divides. God sees what we don't. He sees the difference between the wheat and the tares. We don't. He knows the heart, the true nature, and we don't. But there's also an element of surprise in the timing. The wicked servant was not looking for the return of the master. It came suddenly. And Jesus makes, of course, the comparison with the, the days of Noah. It came suddenly. And so we better learn from these lessons, because soon God will once more create separation, followed by blessing for one group and judgment for the other. And in spite of many warnings and prophecies, it will come unexpected. Suddenly, to most, and I'm talking also to most in the church, to most believers. Uh, I want to read a few ver uh, pieces of scripture that have to do with that coming separation and judgment. And we know them very well. They have to do with the rapture of the church. Um, but I want to uh, emphasize here um, these two, this, this division into two and the um, aspect of um, surprise. You will. The first is uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 3 and 4. It says there, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. So what do we see here? Two groups. One is addressed with they, them, and they, and the other with ye, and you. Two groups. One will befall sudden destruction, 
and the other will not be overtaken. We see the same in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 11 through 13. There it says, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation, through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Again, two groups, one called them and they, yeah, that, um, that will be uh, damned, and the other, uh, you, you, um, beloved of the Lord, who will um, be sanctified and saved. And uh, this is not a new thing. Uh, of course, when we talk about the rapture of the church, we usually read uh, these uh, scriptures, and of course, 1 Corinthians 15, and, and maybe Revelation 4, verse 1. But uh, we find it also in the Old Testament, uh, and in particular in Isaiah 26, uh, verses 20 through 21. Uh, actually, there are more verses around it, but I read only those two. Where God says, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood, and shall no more cover her slain. So again, two groups. It's my people eh, that God says, and he addresses them with thou and thee and thyself, and then it's the inhabitants of the earth and their iniquity. One, to be taken up into the rooms, eh, it's, it's literally the rapture here, uh, and the fulfillment of the promise um, that Jesus makes in um, John 14, in the first uh, few verses. Um, so that's the one group, and the other, the inhabitants of the earth, will befall um, the indignation of the Lord, the wrath of God. Now, after that, there will be again separation for the remnant of God's people, Israel. And that we can read in Revelation 12. It's the woman there, which represents the nation of Israel, that is kept in a safe place for three and a half years at the second half of the tribulation period while the world suffers the wrath of God. And after that there will be another separation, uh, and again followed with judgment, and that is uh, at the end of the millennial reign. And we read this in uh, Revelation chapter 20, towards the end, uh, it speaks there about the white throne judgment. Um, and that's actually how we, we affectionately call it. But uh, we see again there is separation, one group for uh, eternal uh, destruction and uh, the other uh, is, uh, is, is uh, for, for eternal life. Now for us, um, sudden separation is right at the door. We must make sure that we belong to the right group and not by appearance, but for real. And that means we must separate ourselves already from the world. We cannot be in this unity. If we try that, try to be lukewarm, try to be in this gray zone, then um, the division might come across a line that we did not expect. Um, we must separate ourselves already. We must be different because we belong to God and not to the world. Um, this separation this division, the rapture, will happen suddenly. It will come suddenly. And it will come soon. Very soon. And therefore, we must be ready. Now. Amen. Amen.